So uh, a very warm welcome to everybody. If we could please uh, quieten down a little bit, we're going to start the proceedings again now. Thank you very much. Welcome, one and all, to the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution once more. I understand we had a fantastic first talk on art. Uh, we're now following on to philosophical matters uh, with Mary Wollstonecroft. Uh, so I welcome you to the BLSI. My name is Andreas Wasmut. I'm the philosophy and world affairs convener here at the BLSI and also one of its directors. So it is with great, great pleasure that we have a talk on Mary Wollstonecroft, who is a major figure in history, had a very successful and sometimes troubled short life, but she was a great philosopher, a great author, and a great activist for female rights. Uh, and I think this is going to be a very interesting talk uh, because we have somebody very special in our midst and unfortunately only on the screen. We have Silvana Palma Windsor, Countess of St. Andrews, Nee Tomaselli, is a fellow of St. John's College, Cambridge. She specializes in French and British political theory in the 18th century, especially the history of womanhood, and has written about John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, David Hume, Mary Wollstonecraft, and John Stuart Mill. She is the translator of book two of the seminar of Jacques Lacan, the ego in Freud's theory and in the technique of psychoanalysis. The subject of today's talk is Mary Wollstonecraft, on whom she has written two publications, Mary Wollstonecraft, Civil Society, Revolution and Economic Equality, and the acclaimed book, Wollstonecraft, Philosophy, Passion, and politics. Her key interests include the Enlightenment, the history of political thought in the very long 18th century, grand historical narratives, the history of and issues in feminism, modern and contemporary political thought and political philosophy. She is the founding member of the European Center for the Philosophy of Gender in Siegen, Germany, and is currently Director of Studies in History and Social and Political Sciences at St. John's College at the University of Cambridge. And she has been elected a Fellow of the Royal Histor Historical Society. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Silvana Tomaselli to the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. Well, thank you very much for this very generous introduction. And thank you very much for inviting me on this very special day, the day after the International Women's Day. So I'd like to thank Andreas Walsmuth for the invitation and everyone involved, as well as those who are in the room and on Zoom. I listened to the previous presentation and I wish I hadn't because it was very intimidating, very beautiful, and I'm afraid I can only disappoint following that, but I'll do my best. So today I want to speak about Mary Wollstonecraft, who had, as uh, Andrea said, a rather short life, but she packed a lot in that short life. She was the second of um, seven children. She was born in Spitalfield in 1759 in a house in, on Primrose Street. Her paternal grandfather was a rather wealthy man, but, and this is important um, because of Wollstonecraft's views on male primogenitor, he left um, his considerable uh, fortune to Mary Wollstonecraft's brother. Um, and so um, the issue of money, property, and inheritance was not just a theoretical issue for Wollstonecraft. It's something that we will see is rather prominent in her thinking. So if we look at her um, published writings, and we must remember she didn't have a formal education. She engaged with men who did, um, but she had to learn effectively 
on her own. She was an autodidact, although she was helped by a number of uh, people. So you look at her, if you read her work, you see that she has a very uh, good command of the Bible, of ancient philosophy, of Shakespeare and Milton. And while this is something that she acquired uh, as a young woman, it was very much helped by her writing reviews, being asked to write reviews by Joseph Johnson, whose portrait you see here. Um, Joseph Johnson was an important person in her life. He tried to help her as best he could to um, make ends meet, basically, by giving her uh, translations uh, from the Dutch uh, and from the French and by writing reviews. And through this reviewing, she, of course, learned a great deal about the literature, the philosophy, the theology, the science of her period. It's a very um, learned woman, but uh, not due to a formal education. Now, as a woman of uh, no means and um, given her background, she had a limited choice of occupation and she became a lady's companion for a while, a school teacher and a governess. And uh, as such, uh, as a lady's companion, she uh, came to live in Bath and became the companion of a Mrs. Dawson. She uh, didn't stay um, in Bath for very long, but it was an important period for her. Incidentally, her daughter, Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, um, and the daughter by um, Godwin, spent much longer at Bath, and we'll see Bath features later on in this talk. So Bath is an important town um, for um, at least three of the people I'm going to uh, mention today. So Johnson, the publisher I just mentioned, gave her an advance, which was very important for her first book, Thoughts on Education of Daughters with Reflections on Female Conduct in the More Important Duties of Life. And it's, it's not an uninteresting uh, work, but it's not a work from which one would predict what she was going to write later and the kind of um, advocacy for women's right, or indeed for men's right, uh, for, for women's right uh, that for, for which she is known. But it did give some grounding on some of the subjects that she will look and at and discuss in her more famous work of the 1790s. Wollstonecraft tried her hand with her sisters to set up a school. The school didn't work, uh, they lost money, and they had to abandon it, as a result of which Wollstonecraft became a governess to the family of Lord Kingsborough for a brief and unsatisfactory period. Uh, Lady Kingsborough was actually very nice to, to Mary, but Mary just really didn't like an, uh, the aristocratic way of life. It's not clear why she was so um, against this, uh, or, or why she, she was so unhappy in that period. Because, as I said, she was uh, treated with a really unusual consideration, given that she was a governess, taken to the opera, and she learned a great deal. But nonetheless, uh, she uh, had, one might say, a, a prejudice against the aristocracy, and spending time with them didn't actually change her view. If anything, it strengthened it. She returns to London. Joseph. Johnson gives her more literary employment, and then in 1787, she starts her first novel, one she didn't complete, The Cave of Fancy. The same year, she writes original stories from real life, 
And again, this is an attempt to capture uh, a market. In the previous talk, um, the speaker explained how women in the 18th century painters developed the art market. Well, you could say that women in the literary world in the 18th century very much contributed. They weren't the sole agents by any means, but they very much contributed to the commercial aspect of philosophy, of pedagogy, and um, their works are quite noticeable, if only for that. She produces an anthology, The Female Reader, which contains pieces by Voltaire, Hume, Steele, Charlotte Smith, and Madame de Genlis. Until the end of 1789, her articles were not on um, the kinds of subjects that we associate her with. But in December 1789, she reviews a speech by an old friend, uh, Richard Price, entitled A Discourse on the Love of Our Country. And that discourse praises the French Revolution, links the French Revolution to the glorious revolution, the American Revolution, and thinks that the of the French Revolution is marking yet another step towards enlightenment. Uh, Price is uh, adamantly anti-Catholic, so the, the beginning of the end of the Catholic Church. And, and Wollstonecraft is mostly positive about that work, though she has some reservations. But the important thing is that this is really the first time that she thinks about politics um, in a direct and obvious manner. Now, the reason to mention that um, Price's sermon, his discourse on the love of our country, is also because, as you may know, um, it spurred Edmund Burke's very famous reflection on the revolution in France, precisely for the reasons that I've given, namely to link the glorious, the American and the French Revolution together as if they were part of the same phenomenon of enlightenment. And Burke was to argue that the French Revolution bore no resemblance to the glorious revolution, not even to the American Revolution, that it was a completely different phenomenon, namely what we would call a social revolution, not just a, a change at, in form of government, but a, a complete and total revolution. I just want to say a word about Catherine Macaulay. I think it's important not to think and, and idealize or f focus too, too much on some um, women thinking that they were exceptional. Unfortunately, I'm now about to mention a very exceptional woman, but the point I'm trying to make is that Wollstonecraft was not the only one to engage um, on the political scene, and she was not to be the only one to reply, as we will see in a minute, to Burke's reflections on the revolution in France. Catherine Macaulay was in her time extremely well known as a historian. She is um, mentioned in a number of the philosophes work, for example, by uh, Diderot and others as the famous Mrs. Macaulay, the famous historian. She's now, um, we've now remembering her. Uh, we, there are a number of publications that are readily available of her work, but for a long time, she was completely forgotten, even in a history faculties, um, even in my own university. So it may be perverse that on um, the day following the International Women's Day, uh, that um, speaking about a woman who is known for her vindication of the rights of women, I will be concentrating on her vindication of the rights of men and talk about her rebuke to Berg. Incidentally, 
um, Burke actually spent more time at Mars than um, both Wollstonecraft and her daughter, Mary Shelley, combined. He visited Mars, and I have this from the Heritage site. You have a very good um, Heritage website at Mars, I, I noticed. And he, he went there for reason of health and returned there um, before um, he, he later in, in, in life uh, before um, when his health was in very serious decline. Now, Burke in the reflection had argued that um, it's important to think about chivalry and the vestiges of feudal Europe because he emphasized the extent to which it had civilized or begun to civilize Europe and by extension, in his view, uh, humanity. For Burke, manners were, and this is a near quote, more important than laws. What held us together was the way in which we learned to show respect to one another. And this is what made for the fabric of society, something which he thought was being destroyed in France, hence his writing The Reflection. And we must remember that he writes The Reflection, and it's published in 1790, so we're talking about the early part, the early stage of the French Revolution, long before the terror began. So he writes, and I'm giving you a few quotes, I hope you won't mind, uh, this mixed system of opinion and sentiment had its origin in ancient chivalry. It is this that has given its character to modern Europe. And again, nothing is more certain than that our manners, our civilization, and all the good things that are connected with manners and with civilization have in this European world of ours depended for ages upon two principles and were indeed the result of both combined. I mean, the spirit of a gentleman and the spirit of religion, the nobility and the clergy kept learning in existence. And further on, he says that even commerce and trade and manufacture, the gods of economical politicians are themselves perhaps just the effect of this um, civilizing process which he thought had started in the Middle Ages with chivalry. Now, Wollstonecraft is um, asked by Joseph Johnson to produce a reply to the reflection, to Burke's reflection. She does this in a matter of weeks, a little over two weeks. There's a period in which, in the middle of this, she loses heart and self-confidence, but uh, Joseph Johnson manages to restore her self-confidence and then she finishes the work. Wollstonecraft will read an early work of Edmund Burke in order to get a picture of the man as a whole and the, her argument is very much at hominem. She is very much attacking him as a person. But in reading his first major publication, an essay on the origins of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful, she will find a view of women which will incense her and I think is absolutely key to explaining not just her reaction to Burke as expressed in the reflect in the vindication of the rights of men, but also incentivizing her to write subsequently the vindication of the rights of woman. So his her attack is that he's uh, besotted with uh, with rank, besotted with the English Constitution, and a champ champion of private property rather than liberty. So she writes, but in fact, all your declamation leads so directly to this conclusion that I beseech you to ask your own heart when you call yourself a friend of liberty, whether it would not be more consistent to style yourself, sorry, to style yourself the champion of property, the adorer of the golden image, 
which power has set up. Before the reflection, Burke was thought by a number of people, including Wollstonecraft, as one of them. As somebody who would applaud the French Revolution, he'd been very sympathetic to the Americans when they were pleading with Parliament. He was effectively seen as, if not a radical, then someone who uh, could be counted on to, as I say, applaud what was happening in France. And there was a real shock when the reflection appeared and they thought of him as a turncoat, as a fellow traveler, as a hypocrite. Note the word besotted in um, the three points I've made because they're associated with feeling passions, etc., which are very much aligned with a stereotypical view of women at the time. She also claims that he's a dependent and um, um, so there should be, this as a typo uh, here, sorry. Uh, she she claims that he's dependent. Actually, it's completely uh, unfair because he, he wasn't at the time in receipt of any pension. She says she's, he's inconsistent and very much ruled by passion. Again, part of um, the, the stereotypical view of women in that uh, period and says you have a mortal antipathy to reason and effectively saying, you know, if you'd been uh, born at Arras, like Robespierre, you would have been one of those revolutionaries uh, because you would have been carried away by your uh, passion. And um, the other thing that uh, she highlights is the way in which Burke uh, praised Marie Antoinette um, he caught sight of her and clearly was taken by her. But the more serious point, which relates uh, to, to Bath indirectly, is that when Queen Charlotte, um, when, during the Regency, when George III was uh, replaced by the Regent, um, Burke was one of the MPs who was very eager not to give terribly much money to Queen Charlotte the uh, wife of George III. The reason behind that is not that he was mean or uncaring, but he was very concerned along with other, others that there not be a second court. Um, so she lived rather modestly at, at Bath. And of course, Wollstonecraft, even if she could know, know the reasoning behind it, uh, used absolutely everything that she uh, could lay her hands on to discredit Burke. As I said, it's a very personal attack. Later in life, I think she um, comes to see and appreciate Burke's argument um, in a way that she doesn't want to in this piece. But they do share a hatred of vanity and self-love. And they both speak from a uh, effectively Christian discourse and from uh, based on Christian values to a degree, mo modesty, and um, certainly think of pride, vanity as sinful. In speaking about um, Marie Antoinette, um, he, she, she very much accuses him of focusing on the great and forgetting the misery of the poor. And here you have a quotation, not by Wollstonecraft, but by Tom Paine, which very much captures what Wollstonecraft is arguing, uh, namely that Burke pities the plumage but forgets the dying bird. Wollstonecraft does not um, think of history and the progress of civilization the way Burke does, not as a steady accumulation as uh, not as a steady step forward to a so-called civilized age. On the other hand, she does not think that um, you know there's been regress. So she, she tries to explain how the progress has been uneven. And one of the things she certainly doesn't want to do is to attribute any positive uh, contribution 
to the civilizing process, to chivalry. In fact, for her, chivalry is the antithesis of reason, and she looks forward to the waning of its spirit. So what's different about the vindication of the rights of men? Well, it forces her, because of what Burke says about property, to think about property and to think about inheritance, inherited wealth, um, male um, primogenitor, and how in, in property families, but not just, um, the question of inheritance distorts relations that property distorts relations between men and between parents and children. So what, what happens then in this rather short work, which should be like all the others, uh, other replies to the reflection, there were many responses uh, to Burke's um, reflection, most of them, if not all negative, some wholly negative, People changed their mind as the revolution unfolded. But certainly when it came to the publication in 1790 of the reflection, the wave was very much anti-Burke. And one would have expected her to just talk about the rights of men, given the title, to talk about what was happening in France, how justified the revolution was, and so forth. But actually, there is very little about that in The Vindication of the Rights of Men, even relatively little about rights. She says human beings have rights, but uh, doesn't really develop it. What is odd is she speaks about marriage. And this is rather unexpected. She speaks about marriage because, as I've said, she's drawn to the topic because she considers property and then talks about love, talks about feelings, talks about the way in which in families already, social expectations, the what she sees the evil of materialism distorts human beings, distorts their conception of the good life of themselves and um, interpersonal relations. So she says, who can count, recount all the unnatural crimes which the desire of perpetuating an, a name and we might add of passing on property of accumulating it in the first instance has produced and one of the other things she thinks follows from that is the pernicious consequence uh, namely um, that it uh, bars early marriages that you know, on the marriage market, it the people wait to see what the best deal, I suppose, is for uh, their daughters or, or son. And that, in her view, has a terrible psychological effect. It distorts men as well as women. Uh, men become very selfish. They get uh, they, they spend far too much time on their appearance. And you see here uh, a caricature of a member of a club called the Macaronis with a ridiculous uh, headgear. I doubt that anyone had such a headgear, but they must have had something approximating that. Anyway, she thinks that this then leads to moral corruption, to sexual depravity. And Wollstonecraft is not a prude. Uh, she it's, she, she um, doesn't... Uh, condemn sexual relations in, in any way, but she does think that this kind of um, lasciviousness is um, very pernicious, especially given that this is a period in which uh, women who um, have uh, children out of wedlock and so forth are then socially excluded. So here we see her talking about the effect that it has on women. We, the previous quote looked at, um, uh, spoke of the effect on men. And she says, you know, in our society, uh, love has been pushed out by these market relations, which characterize the conception of marriage and the relationship between men and women. 
So as I said earlier, uh, she had looked at a uh, philosophical inquiry. She may have read it before, but she certainly returned to it. Um, and this is a very important book, work by Burke, his um, very early major publication, very influential in um, on the continent, where there's a debate about the nature of sublime, very influential in Germany. But in it, Burke distinguishes between um, love and, I mean, the beautiful and the sublime, and associates beauty with love. And if you um, read the quote on the screen, you will understand perhaps how this would not go down well with um, a woman such as Wollstonecraft. I distinguish love from desire or lust, uh, Burke wrote so far, is perfection considered as such from being the cause of beauty that this quality where it is the highest in the female sex almost always carries with it an idea of weakness and imperfection. So that would be bad enough to associate women with weakness and imperfection and beauty being both lovely and not quite right. But what follows from this would be even more provocative to someone like Wollstonecraft. Women are very sensible of this. And for this reason, they learn to lisp, to totter in their walk, to counterfeit weakness, even sickness. In all this, they are guided by nature. Beauty in distress is much more affecting beauty. Blushing has little less power and modesty in general, which is a tacit allowance of imperfection, is itself considered as an amiable quality and certainly heightens every other that is so. And then we also, he, as if this weren't enough, he says, those persons who creep into the hearts of most people who are chosen as their companions for their softer hours and their relief from care and anxiety are never persons of shining quality, nor strong virtues. It is rather the soft green, a sort of avocado green of the soul on which we rest our eyes that are fatigued with beholding more glaring objects. So, um, Wollstonecraft doesn't like this one bit. Um, she very much wants to look forward to a world in which uh, men and women um, have relationships in which they respect one another. But she thinks that women, as they are presently educated or rather not educated, as they're encouraged to live to appear. And given what I've said earlier about how marriage is seen as a property transaction, she thinks that women are not made respectable. And so the question is for her, which she will address in the Vindication of the Rights of Woman, how do you make what she deems to be these weak beings respectable? So the reason why I think that the vindication of the rights of men is the most important work of Wollstonecraft is because although it's short, it's written in a hurry, it's not uh, a very consistent, coherent thesis, it's very passionate, but it brings together what will be the making of all of her um, philosophy aesthetic views, her views about um, relationship, about marriage, about parent-children relationship, about uh, social relation, about the division of labor, about poverty, and so forth. So this is effectively the bundle prompted by Burke's re reflection. So in some ways, we owe Wollstonecraft to Burke. Um, or to the fact that Burke made her very angry. Um, property, Wilson Craft wrote, um, should be fluctuating 
as she doesn't want the elim uh, elimination of private property far from it, but she wants a more equal distribution of it. She's critical of, of men who, uh, in her view, become effeminate, of luxury. She wants women to be um, uh, rational creatures, to be um, not to look to uh, outside of the, uh, the the themselves, if you wish, to um, and be uh, good mothers. They said um, she does not at all expect uh, or want women to uh, necessarily become um, marry or or be mothers. In fact, quite to the contrary, she is insistent that women should be given education such that should they choose not to marry or become widows, they can be independent. Nothing uh, is worse in her view than having to marry uh, to support yourself. And one of the things that's important and, and why I insist on the vindication of the rights of men as well as the vindication of rights of women is that she always thinks about both the sexes. She uh, thinks, and this was nothing unusual in the 18th century, that the sexes mutually corrupt each other and will mutually improve one another. So it's a combination. And likewise, she never just talks about the duties of mothers without thinking about the duties of fathers. So she thinks about parenthood very much. So both the sexes must fulfill their duties. And then, you know, she's, of course, always trying not to frighten the horses because she wants something to be done. So she doesn't want to alienate her, um, her audience. And I underline the, this part of the quotation uh, for uh, the sake of speed, because I see I'm coming to the end of my time, but I let me read it if I may. I only recreated an imagination, she said, fatigued by contemplating the vices and follies which all proceed from a feculent stream of wealth that has muddied the pure reels of natural affection by supposing that society will sometime or other be so constituted that man must necessarily fulfill the duties of a citizen or be despised, and that while he was employed in any department of civil life, his wife, also an active citizen, should be equally intent to manage her family, educate her children, and assist her neighbors. As I said already, this is not to imply that women must be mothers. Uh, it is not to imply that women should not partake of um, life in civil society in um, assisting their neighbors or indeed participating in politics. So what might women do? Well, they might study the art of healing, she said. She, they'd like to, they could be physician as well as nurses. And uh, midwifery, uh, which was a traditional women's occupation, was at that time being um, increasingly occupied by men who uh, she calls accoucheurs and they're the the profession was being overtaken by men. And this is, uh, she's pushing back on this um, because, you know, there weren't that many uh, positions open to women and men's encroachment of midwifery was something she very much deplored. She also wants women to study politics so that they rest their benevolence on a broader basis. She thinks we should be reading history which is, she thinks, much better than reading novels, but she would rather we read novels than nothing at all, but um, preferably uh, history. And uh, she wants us to know about the character of the times, the, about political improvement, about progress, uh, so that we have a clear understanding of the nature 
of civilization. And what she wants, therefore, is not just a, a history of men or of particular men, but really a wider history of society as a whole. And then she says rather coyly, you know, I might excite laughter by dropping a hint, which I mean to pursue some future time. Unfortunately, uh, she didn't. Uh, for I really think that women ought to have representatives, so uh, members of parliaments, instead of being arbitrarily governed without having any direct shared allowed them in the deliberation of government. In the 60s and 70s, scholarship on Wollstonecraft tended to bemoan the fact that she wrote a lot about women, the family, motherhood, and held this against her. I think that um, to do so is to misunderstand the importance of family for both men and women in her conception. But in any event, whatever one thinks about this, she certainly did not want women to be um, kept in the so-called domestic uh, sphere. And she it's important, I think now is a better moment for this kind of reflection. She never belittled um, the family, the household, helping one's neighbor and that kind of, um, well, what one might say, the, the a basis of, of society. But I, I'm also insistent that she never intended women to be left out of civil society more widely uh, or um, the political sphere. So she calls for revolution. She wants a revolution in our self-perception, in our manners. And why is that? Well, because she wants us to regain a lost dignity. It is time, she says, to effect a revolution in female manners time to restore to them their lost dignity and make them as a part of the human species labor by reforming themselves to reform the world. Thank you very much. Silvana, thank you very much indeed. We all thought we we're just going to hear about Mary Wollstonecraft, but we heard about a whole ensemble of people, Napoleon, Marie Antoinette. We had, we had Joseph Johnson, Catherine, Catherine Macaulay. Uh, we had Edmund Burke, who was obviously a provocateur in Mary's view, and obviously got her to, to write some of the most important political and, and, and philosophical works. So, We've now got time for questions, 15 minutes or so. So should we start in the room and then see what's happening online? Does anybody have any questions? Everybody's very quiet at the moment. Okay, Betty? Thank you very much. Uh, some of you in the room will know that I'm trying to rectify the gender balance in the plaques in Bath where women don't have very many. And one of the women that I think definitely should have a plaque is Catherine McCauley, who you mentioned. And I was wondering if you might expand a little on uh, any relationship she had with other women. Um, I hope I heard the question correctly. So if you're asking me what relationship she had with other women, then um, the, the answer is that she had a very strong feeling. She loved a, a young woman in her youth called Fanny. Fanny was very important to her, so important that um, she traveled to Portugal, where Fanny had uh, gone with her husband, uh, to now, Wollstonecraft went to Portugal to assist um, Fanny in um, delivering her child. Unfortunately, the child and Fanny um, both died. Um, Wollstonecraft's first daughter was called uh, Fanny. 
uh, by Im, um, Gilbert Imley. She admired uh, Catherine Macaulay very much, and there is some evidence that they mutually influenced one another in matters of philosophy. They were both uh, very interested in the in uh, undermining the um, the debates about free will. They just wanted people to get on with it, basically, and stop banging on about whether or not we had free will. Um, you know, there's too much to do in the world and worry about whether we have free will in Macaulay's and Wollstonecraft's view. So she also admired somebody like Catherine the Great. So it's not that she didn't admire uh, any women, but she was very critical of many of them. Uh, one of the persons that whose writing she uses is uh, Helen Maria Williams, who one might say is a pioneer in uh, as a war correspondent uh, going to to revolutionary France. Um, she only left it because she was forced to uh, by the revolutionaries. So she um, she re respects women that she deems to be respectable. Um, this is it's just one of the things that she lives mostly in a world of men, and she is also very beholden on um, men like Joseph Johnson, who help her eke a living um, to writing, translating, reviewing. Does that answer your question? No woman is an island. Um, I, I have a very quick question as well, uh, Silvana. And generally, I think it is Emelina uh, Pankhurst who is seen as the first wave of feminism. To what extent do you think could could Mary Wollstonecraft be seen as the originator of feminism in the 18th century? Well, uh, she is often called this, but the the person who is called the first English feminist is Mary Estelle, a late 17th century writer. I don't really um, partake in this, you know, the first, the second, and, and so forth. And I don't really like labeling um, Wollstonecraft or anyone else because with any label, feminist, conservative, liberal, and I used the word radical and regretted it as soon as I it passed my lips. But, you know, they, they are, there comes all kinds of expectations as to what they should have said, uh, what they should have done, and that's not terribly helpful. But there's no doubt that um, she discussed the issue of the status of women and what was to be done to rectify um, what she saw as their condition. So it, she's an important contributor to this. She was very influential in America in the um, 19th century, influenced James um, John Stuart Mill. Um, but there were other women, you know, Macaulay also writes about the condition of women. Uh, Helen Maria Williams writes on the condition of women. So many, uh, and indeed, men wrote on the condition of, of, of women. So to um I think you know to seek to label her, we all for every movement, there's always an attempt to find the founding mother, the founding father. But I don't think it's always terribly helpful. Okay, thank you. Any other questions in the room? Just another sort of sticking to Bath a bit, but um, I just wonder if you can strike any comparison between Wollstonecraft and, and Jane Austen. Um, her, if you think about Jane Austen's novels in which reason is very much valued and, and rational women, um, like Elizabeth Bennet in Pride yes. and Prejudice is, is rational and learning and learns yeah. as opposed to the frivolity of her sister. I mean, is that, yeah. You think yeah, that's, that's, that's bang on Wollstonecraft. And and she had to, she was rather annoyed with her sisters. Uh, she did what she could for them. One had a 
what we would well, one was she was either with an abusive husband and or had postnatal depression. And Wilson uh, comes to her rescue as best she can, uh, on some account, kidnaps the sister and the child. But um, you you put your finger on it. it. It's absolutely that kind of woman that she wants, woman who is independent and um, and and strong and rational, yes. Okay, quite a few hands up. There's a gentleman here in that third row. Well, hello. Could I ask about her faith and was she um, a believer in the church and did um, what was her attitude towards Christianity and towards the church? Did you did you hear that, Silvana? No, I'm afraid not. I wish I were with you. I haven't been a, to Bath in in a long time. I know. I, I think I th to paraphrase the question is, what was her attitude towards the church? Well, that's a good question as well. Um, she has no time for clerics. Um, she she remains a, a nominal member of the Anglican Church. Most of her friends, like Joseph Johnson. Uh, Richard Price are dissenters, very active dissenters on Newington Green. So um, her sympathies are with dissenters, but she's not one herself. What she deplores, especially in um, her earlier writings, the vindication of the rights of men in particular, is anything that is remotely smells and bells and um, high. Um, clerical hierarchy in i think when she travels to St scandinavia i think she starts thinking a little bit differently in a more nuanced manner about institutions of all kinds so it may well be that had she lived longer her position might have been more um well qualified on the on the church, but certainly in the vindication of the rights of men and women, she has no time for it whatsoever. Okay, I think we've got probably another four or five minutes, so we've got a few questions at the back now. Thank you very much for that talk. Uh, could we say, given that she was against private property, uh, could we consider her as an early communist? And is it possible Karl Marx may have read some of her writings? And um, another little question, during her time, was there anyone else in particular who was also talking about against uh, private property. Thank you. Well, I, I'm i sorry if I misled. She's not against private property. What she is against is the uneven distribution of property. So, for example, she says, you know, we have all this land and all these people who are uh, in want of a place to live um, in, in fields to, to, to cultivate. So why aren't they divided um, and distributed to the people who need them? And part of this is that she's quite partial to work. She, she doesn't like idleness. She she doesn't she she wants even those who don't have to work because they have money to be occupied. There's something I think she thinks it, we develop our minds better. So I didn't mean to give the impression that she wants the abolition of property. At least not. She may have moved towards this, but it's much from what I see in her writing. It's about. Um, the inequality of its distribution, and also what she sees as centralization, as the uh, 
increase in the specialization and intensification of the division of labor. So she's concerned and she gets this, uh, as she quotes Adam Smith, who is likewise uh, concerned about the impact on the mind of repetitive work for those uh, people who are involved in um, manufacture repetitive work and how he thinks and she does as well and quotes him that it atrophies the mind so this is sufficient um, she would like a world in which we are if you wish from a more artisan based wor world one in which it's not that there's no private property, but there is greater equality. But um, one that isn't concentrated around London or uh, capitals like Versailles, because she thinks this is very bad for humanity as a whole. Whether Marx read her, I don't know. But that those kinds of ideas were uh, um, quite uh, common. I mean, sorry, uh, they were available uh, at the beginning and mid uh, 19th century. Okay, we've just got one time for one more question at the back of the room, and then we have to draw things to a conclusion so we can all have lunch. Um, thank you very much, because um, you've uh, given me a new perspective on uh, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft's mind, because until today, I saw her as a sort of... Um, um, uh, sort of someone who was bringing the, the fact that women had a mind uh, in, into focus, and she was that's what she was focusing on. But after today's talk, I've, I see her more as a person, um, you know, more focused on the practical issues, you know, uh, uh, how society is set up and so on and so forth. And that seemed to be her passion until she died. And yeah. I just want to reflect on the fact that her own daughter, Mary, who of course, um, Mary uh, Shelley, never yes. saw her mother, but her no. mind developed entirely in a different way because um, um, Frankenstein is a work of imagination. It's a work of, you know, all in the mind basically, which I yeah. thought what Mary Wollstonecraft was fighting for recognition of. I thought she was fighting for recognition of women's mind but actually, what she had thought about was uh, the recognition of women's practical rights, you know? So I just thought I'd reflect back the two perspectives that mother and daughter gave to, um, you know, society. Well, uh, yes, I... Wilson Croft was eager for men and women, but... Um, this was more worrisome in the case of, of women. Uh, she was very eager that they ha be physically strong as well as mentally strong. You know, life uh, is never a bed of roses for uh, most people, but it certainly wasn't for most women, if not all women in uh, the 18th century. You, you're thinking, uh, you know, this. Uh, there isn't contraception, uh, the, the level of death in, in childbirth is very high, children die, so it's a, it, it's, a, it's a very hard world. And one of the things that she thinks is that women, or at least some women, are not prepared for that. They're not prepared physically, and they're not prepared emotionally, uh, as well as mentally, for the world as it truly is. And then as a result, of course, they don't, they don't help the world become a better place for anyone. So it's about the mind, it's about the emotions, it's about the character. Really, it's about character. What she wants us is to have the kind of character that makes for the reproduction of a healthy society and healthy human beings with it. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sure you all agree that this was a fantastic talk and uh, massively new insights into Mary Wollstonecraft. So please, once again, put your hands together to show your appreciation. Thank you very much for having me.